Good morning, everybody. Here we are for another reveal. This one's number 308. We're going to take our chances on a 1968D roll. 1968D is one of those issues where you're either going to get something wonderful or you're going to get shut out. Chances of being shut out are probably about 90%. There's at least two different decent RPMs to find. A few decent double die obverses and one massive double die reverse. So here we go. Frank, the subscription works like this. You ask to be placed on the list and when spaces come available, I let you know. Should you choose to take spaces, they are $100 per month per spot. And you are guaranteed to be in every reveal on the list for that month. And I create the list ahead of time so you know what's coming up. So everyone who is subscribed to the September reveals already have a complete list of all of the September reveals. We're still working on the August reveals right now. But that's how that works. Okay, Frank, we can do that for sure. Malcolm. Hey, Malcolm. These are reveals from last month. I didn't get these done last week as I had planned. Had a medication change and had some issues with my medication change. I was having trouble staying awake. <laughs> you don't want me falling asleep while I'm doing a reveal. Just not a good thing. Okay, here we go. Got the coins out of the wrapper. And we're ready to go. Here's number 308, coin number one, Jeff Dunn. Let's see what we have under here. Okay, like I said, I'm looking for a nice RPM. Try to get this thing to stop moving. <clears throat> there we go. Looking for a nice RPM, nice couple of double dies. Double die obverse, generally what you're going to be checking for the double die obverse or obverses is this area inside the G right here. You can sometimes see notching right there on that crosslet. You'll see an extra crosslet up here. So you'll see a notch right there in the, in the crosslet. Hey, Jeff, Coin Dragon, Jesse Minter. But this one doesn't happen to be one of the double diobverses we'd be looking for. So I'm going to keep moving on and see if we have the double die reverse. If we have a double die reverse, I am going to be very shocked. They do come along, not very often, but they, they do come along. <coughs> and that one turns out to be... A relatively nice but normal coin now 68d do come pretty nice sometimes but a very high grade coin it's worth good money really good money actually 67 would be a real nice slam of a coin I'll let you know if I see anything that appears to be 67 material now with regard to this issue here with the uh, motto seemingly not striking up all the way or the motto connected to the rim that turns out to be an issue on almost all 1968 cents in fact finding one that has good true full detail is nearly impossible um, the steps are usually pretty nice on the reverse in fact the the reverses are usually relatively well struck except right here in the center center of the reverse you're often going to have strike issues because the relief is so high on the other side this is the last year of the full high relief bust on Lincoln ho oh, Brian hope things are going well with you today haven't talked to you in a little while 
Given this, a possibility, maybe, that 1968D can prove to show us something nice. There's a little struck through right there. It's a struck through fiber of some sort, maybe a little piece of, uh, it's actually a little slag of copper probably that it was struck through and then it fell out. A little sliver piece of copper. going to have to check the reverses on all of these because well the reverse is really more what we're after here that one was for Carl let's move on to the next coin number four this one goes to Eric and yeah it looks like we have nothing here A little bit nicer than a couple of these others have been. Relatively fully struck. The 1968 <clears throat> was the last year that they used the master that they had been using for a couple of decades at that point. <clears throat> Which is the primary reason why it's very soft looking. Don't have a whole lot of detail on the obverse. The reverses are usually pretty nice. But the obverse, ugh, yucky yuck. In 1969, they changed the overall design. Be a little bit lower in relief and look a little bit more like the Lincoln that Victor Brenner had intended back in especially looking for an RPM here, looking for any separation at the date. <clears throat> there are some 1968D double diob verses that show separation at the date. Not good separation, but you know, a little bit of minor separation. I always check that crosslet on the G because that's that's where your class 2 double dies are going to show up best on the obverse, especially in 1968D. Uh, this one's from Malcolm. Hello, Ted. <clears throat> Let's go over real quick. Basically what we're looking for. Get this set up so that I can see what I can see. See, I need to move over just a little bit more. There we go. Okay, and we're going to do a search for 1968 and go to the D-Mint. And so the double die obverses that we're generally looking for are going to look, I'll show you one of the ones I know is a relatively nice one. It's going to look like this. You can see that, that little bit of a split in the G. There's extra G there. There's extra O here. You can see it on the E in we. And it doesn't show up real well in a lot of spots because the design is so soft. So you're always looking for that, that little notch in the G right there. That holds true with this one, this one, this one. There's a number of them. And then here's your double die reverse very very nice double die reverse you can see notching in pretty much all the lettering looks really strong when you stick it under a scope I mean look at it here on America very very nice doubling <clears throat> we are going to work through trying to replace all these smaller images with larger images at some point check Okay, this one it's a little more visible. You can see it just a little bit better. I think this is one of the coins I have. Which I should get back out and photograph as soon as I'm able. Let's 
but that's the double die reverse that we'd be looking for. Here's your RPM, RPM number one. FS listed, D over D West. Beautiful little gig we got going on right there. And then RPM two, I don't have any photos of. And then some of the other RPMs, they're relatively minor, but they are there. You can see here you have a hook coming out the east part of the mint mark. That's number three. And number four. Um, a number of the RPMs that were listed in the original RPM book are now considered a damage mint mark punch, which I'm not 100% sure that I agree with. Uh, this is another one of the actual RPMs that's listed. They, they show a little bit of doubling on the top, like right across the very top of the, of the mint mark. And I don't know if it's actually an RPM that people don't want to mess with or if it's a damaged punch of some sort. But they, they, look, they look more like this, where they've got just a, a, an extra piece right across the top. So that's what we're after. And here we go. Coin number six goes to Sireg. Chances of finding the stuff that I just showed you in rolls. Eh, 10, 20%. Not great. Not real bad either. Yeah, they do show up once in a while. <clears throat> you have to look to know. And unfortunately, got to play the game, right? I'm going to zoom this out so we can see better. There we go. There. A little bit better look at everything. Let's flip this over and take a look at the reverse, not a double die reverse. If it was the DDR, it would be very obvious. Trust me. Very obvious. All right, coin number seven. Adam Chambers. And Mr. Adam comes out with... Yeah, it's not one of the RPMs. <clears throat> doesn't appear to be any one of the double dies try to get a better focus there just a little better there we go don't have anything going on there either probably isn't one of the better rolls to start the morning with I tend to lose myself in these because they are just a little bit difficult to be patient with because the design is so mushy on these. The design loves to be difficult. Loves to be difficult on these little guys anyway. We'll make our way through this roll. What do we got coming up next? I don't even know. Next is going to be a 56D roll. 1956D. It's coming up next hour. Yeah, I was thinking there for a minute. We just could have that East Hook RPM. But when you're looking at stuff like this, you have to be sure that you're cognizant of everything in the area so if you look at this right here it looks like oh well that looks like it could be a little hook to the east on the mint mark and don't hyper focus on this what you're looking at is you're looking at everything around here and you're trying to drag clues in as to what you have now while this could actually look like a little hook representing the lower part of a curve on a d what you need to pay attention to is that this 
matches up with this and this and this and this and this and so you've got scratches running in that direction and since you've got scratches running in that basic direction 99 percent our chances are going to be that this is just another scratch related to the others so don't get yourself all worked up thinking hey i've got something good here you got to make sure that you're looking at everything that you're taking in all of the detail all of the detail it's a forensic science you have to be a detective you can't just jump to conclusions you have to actually look into what you're looking at and see if what you're looking at matches up to what you should expect for what you think it could be that's the tricky part yeah the tricky part that's the part that takes time to learn not something that's going to just develop overnight that's for sure but if you watch these shows you may just learn a little faster than you would if you forced yourself to do it on your own. Just a little bit faster, maybe. I'll share with you some of the experience that I've had over the years of looking at coins under microscopes. Hey, Randy. Just a little bit of the experience I've had can go a long way in helping a person understand what's going on here. That's what I hope to share with these shows. Give everyone a chance to watch and learn a little. Scope and light is not playing nicely this morning. I'll try to do a little bit of readjusting between shows here. I do have another show coming up as soon as this one's over, and then I think I'm going to take a few hours break so that I can try to get a little bit of mail out and get some invoices sent. I did send about a third of the invoices from last night this morning. I did not get to all of them, though. Maybe a little bit in later in the afternoon before I can get to all of them. I have to get some packages done, get things ready for my postal carrier when she shows up. So there'll be something for her to take back to the post office. Something that you guys may or may not know, and I'll share with you now. This is regarding the U.S. Postal Service. The Postal Service, if you live on a rural route, which I do, if you don't live in the middle of a city and you schedule a pickup for mail that you have going out instead of taking your packages to the post office you let them come to you during the regular carrier time if you have scheduled a pickup through their website your postal carrier will stop at your house ring the bell knock on the door whatever make your dogs bark and you hand them that package. They take that package from their route back to the post office. They actually get paid for doing that. So they actually get a little bit of a bonus for having packages on their route. Something a lot of people don't know. Now, they don't get that for just picking up envelopes. It has to be packages. First class parcels or priority mail <clears throat> generally something with tracking oops I don't think I looked at the reverse on that one I have had occasion on a 1968 D roll now I will let you know that that 68 D roll was circulated but I have had an occasion where I found one double die reverse in an entire roll. So I make sure I look at every coin. Here's another little tidbit for you. 
has nothing to do with coins. But I thought I'd let you know anyway. If you do not have or are not familiar with an air fryer, take my word for it. It's worth its worth its weight in gold. Air fryers are not just fryers. They're not just for fried chicken and french fries. The word fryer for air fryer just sounds so unhealthy. However, an air fryer is probably one of the healthiest ways to cook food. And it is so much faster. I have actually cooked ribeyes on an air fryer with a grill insert. And they taste pretty much as good as if they were cooked on the grill outside. And they cook in so much less time. Take about 8 to 10 minutes. We have salmon steaks. We cook salmon steaks. We can grill them in the air fryer. Doesn't require any oil. Although I do put butter on mine because they taste better that way. Butter and garlic. Salmon steaks take about five minutes. Five minutes to cook in the air fryer. You can also do cod. You can do catfish, bass, anything you catch in the air fryer. Really good. Here's that same die again. Looks like it could possibly have a hook over on the right hand side of the D, but if you look at everything else in the area, it screams, I'm a die scratch. Don't worry about me. Air fryers are not expensive when you consider what all they can do and what they can do for you. <clears throat> Your monitor died on you. Ouch. Of course, I haven't used one monitor in probably 15 years, 10 or 15 years. I've been using dual monitors for a long time. I don't see how I could have done it without using dual monitors. Back in a time when one monitor was the norm, I was always looking for a way to get more. I actually went through the process of getting a second monitor before it was even common. Before it was even a commonplace thing, I already had two monitors. If I had enough room, I'd have three. Here's one for Mac. Mac's out at a state fair right now. I guess it's the New York State Fair. Having fun selling raffle tickets and looking through the money. Checking paper notes for serial numbers and all that cool jazz. Hope he's having fun and it's not too hot. Wear your sunscreen, Mac. <clears throat> Our weather here has been very roasty the last week. We've been in the mid to upper 90s most of the week. Right now, we have a bit piece of the remnants of Ida moving through this area. We're catching the southern and eastern part. Oh, Larry got this coin. There, my friends, is the fingerprint of an employee of some bank where these were wrapped. 53 years ago. 53 years ago. I wonder if they're still alive. Could be. They were a little bit younger. My parents were 22 when I was born in 1968. And they're still alive. Both of them still bouncing around pretty well. I mean, all things considered. They're not playing softball and football anymore, but... 
or at least able to get around. My dad's doing quite a bit better, I do believe. So I'll have to call him again and talk to him, get an update on what's going on. But a little bit of a health scare. Went into the hospital overnight. Still not sure what was wrong with him. Yeah, part of the problem, Randy, when you're talking about getting really up close to coins, when you're looking at coins, you have to have a lens, an actual glass lens, that will allow for you to get that close. So you have to have a good macro on a phone in order for a phone to get close enough to a coin. Software cannot make magnification happen. <clears throat> So if you think about it this way, take a picture through your window with your camera and then go to your computer and blow that picture up so that you would theoretically be able to see the feathers on a bird sitting in the tree in your backyard. Well, you won't be able to because you don't actually have the detail on the receptor on your camera to show those feathers. You can't create that detail out of nothing. You have to have the detail through the lens onto the receptors before your computer can actually bring, blow it up and make it that way. So in order for a scope of any sort to work on a phone, it actually has to have a glass lens that you're looking through. <clears throat> That does your magnification. Now some phones have a really good macro setting. And have the ability to do that. Most phones don't have that good of a macro setting. And don't have that capability. If you don't have that capability to begin with. No amount of software is going to make it happen. <clears throat> Not clearly enough to use them as a microscope. So generally what people end up having to do is they end up having to buy a an adapter, a little piece that slides over the edge of the phone and has a little magnifying lens that goes over the camera. So you've actually got a physical lens creating the magnification that you need and then the software to view it generally works pretty well pretty well. I've seen some pretty good pretty good shots taken with cameras with a adapter lens, macro lens. But the idea that you're going to use a piece of software to make your not so great camera take really great pictures or be able to see a lot of detail where no detail was captured just not going to happen. This one's nice and clear. Again, another one of those with that little thing on the bottom of the D. We've seen this die before. This is an original roll. So we are going to see repeats of the same dies over and over again. <clears throat> I would hate to know the cost of what... You'd end up paying for a phone that has enough macro, has a good enough macro lens to use it as a microscope on its own. Now my phone will do a pretty decent job taking pictures through a microscope. But once again, you have to have that glass lens to do the blowing up. You can't do it with software in your phone. And once you've blown it up with a glass lens, the photography can be good because you don't have to blow up the image in the phone. You don't have to expand the size of what the pixels, the pixels are capturing. Yes, I can do that, Jeff. My biggest problem is that I'm having... A little bit of trouble seeing what I'm doing because I don't have my 
There we go. I have my YouTube up and I'm seeing everything at a delay like you guys are. There we go. Tried to upgrade your phone yesterday to S21 Ultra. It has a macro lens, but since your B O L L is behind, your bill is be is your your bill is behind. AT and T took your last two payments due. Have you thrown off your carpet? Rejected your early upgrade. Oh no. Sixteen hundred dollars for a phone? Seriously? You can get a good microscope for that. There we go. That's better. Sorry about that, Jeff. And coin number 27 now. Mike Birchman. So this is going to probably turn out to be one of those rolls that's pretty much like 90% of the other 1968D rolls where what you see turns out to be pretty much just normal normal <clears throat> yeah with me the uh, the the microscope package that I purchased from Amscope it's got a microscope it's got a camera and it's got the software on which I am viewing what comes out of the camera and showing it to you the overall package was about nine hundred dollars of course I can't use it to make a phone call it's not a very good organizer either but it does a pretty good job of magnifying coins <clears throat> the light that I'm using is a halogen bulb inside of a box with two flexible metal conduits containing fiber optic cable <clears throat> that will shine light out of the end of the little conduits. You take those and you bend them around toward each other. You put a lens of some sort between them and it floods light onto your coin which is the best way to do photography is with indirect lighting ambient lighting not with bulbs shining directly on the coin without my little lens cap that I use which is a coin tube I'll show you the coin tube here's my coin tube that I use it's just a an old coin tube it's an old penny tube it's milky plastic it's cut off at both ends and this used to be black but it was covered with black construction paper you can see how it's uh, kind of given me a little bit of a uh, color shift over the years and then <clears throat> that works with my microscope light down here let me show you what it looks like without. This one's for Mike Birchman here, number 29. There's what it looks like without. And if I point the light directly at the coin, that's what it looks like without the cover. So when I put my cover on, it actually tames that light down a little bit and turns it into more of a floodlight. A floodlight is what you need. It needs to be a, di a, a directional floodlight, a very small floodlight. It shines on the coins from a particular direction to give you shadows. If you need those shadows to see your splits and your serifs and to see your notching at the corner of the double die letters. But it needs to be at a direct enough angle to create shadow all the way around your devices, all the way around your letters. So, 
for instance, what I'm saying is the side walls of the letter has shadows going all the way around the letter. All the way around. That's the angle of light that you need. Not not like like this, where you see that there's a lot of light on one side, and then there's a lot of shadow on the other side. Not good. Not good. What you're looking for is something that has shadow going all the way around the lettering. That way you can see all the finer details, all the little things. <clears throat> Microscope is a relatively simple non-powered microscope. No lights, no nothing on the microscope. Mic microscope is simply a microscope. That's all it is. Two eyepieces infinite zoom infinite zoom means that you have a knob that you can turn to make the zoom go in and out so with one of them that you're going to see that's going to have a 10 20 you're going to be able to see like this magnification or this magnification but nothing in between and with the infinite zoom you've got a knob that you can turn that changes the zoom on your scope to go in and out softly so that you can use any magnification you want that's what infinite zoom does. Infinite zoom, stereo optical, meaning two eyepieces. Let me get this out of the way. My lighting is so close in angle to the angle of the optics, sometimes that little lampshade that I just showed you, get, it gets in the way. And when it gets in the way, you have a little bit of darkness at the, at the very edge of, this, of the captured video. <clears throat> so infinite zoom stereo optical and you want to be able to see now the uh, here's how the the magnification works on this this microscope is a 0 0.5x to 3.5x microscope 0 0.5 to 3.5 so it's going to show from one half of zoom all the way to three and a half times zoom but it also has 10x eyepieces on it the 10 X eyepieces make for 10 times that number. So you're actually seeing it at five times to 35 times. And then the camera itself also will zoom a little bit. And then you've got different optical qualities. This particular optical quality is the lowest optical quality I can show you that gives us an image that has virtually no jog or, 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 you know, where it moves too fast for us to see it moving. Basically makes you seasick. But I can show you briefly what it can do. This is the highest resolution that it works at. The problem is that when I move the coin, it takes too long to capture the video. But it does a great job of zooming in and giving us full detail. It just takes a while to get everything in place because it takes so long to refresh the screen. But if I need to see a lot of detail, I can get a lot of detail. but I prefer to use the much lower zoom capability simply because it gives me a nice smooth video transition. Come on. So that when I'm moving the coin around, it doesn't take a long time to refresh because when you're using it at its highest capability you're talking about a massive number of pixels to digest it takes it just a long time to refresh and so I use the this is the lowest possible video quality 
This is 1,228 pixels by 922. My highest capability is 4,912 pixels by 3,684. So it is a 4,912 pixels wide picture photograph that I can take. I have to change my exposure time again. There we go. <coughs> With the highest possible video capability of this camera. We're up to coin number 32 right now. This one's for Mr. McBride, who will see this video later. And we have nothing on that one. Coin number 33 for Eric Beyer. You would think because now this might be something that you might be processing, might be thinking about, that because your letters are basically merged with the rim up here, <coughs> that you would automatically have a late die state coin. Not true. The die started its life with those letters merged with the rim. So the very earliest die state are still going to have the letters very, very close to the rim. In fact, touching the rim in most cases. You have to use something different to determine die state on these coins with the very worn out design. This one's from Mr. Fletcher. You can use the edge of anything out toward the rim and just look at how sharp it is. This right here will give you a good indication of die state. Okay, sir, first of all, here you have flow lines. That's what these are. That creates your luster. So these flow lines tell us that we're not early die state. Early die state will not have flow lines in the field. But we do still have relatively sharp outer edges of the devices near the rim. So since we still have those relatively sharp outer edges, we're not late die state either. So this is not early die state, it's not late die state, it has to be between those, it would be mid die state. So this is either an early mid die state, mid die state, or late mid die state. And that is generally determined by how heavy the flow lines are or how many lines there are coming out of the devices. This one's just going to be mid die state. It's not an early mid and it's not a late mid, it's just mid die state. Now we should be able to see, see some sharpness at the tops of these letters. Okay, here's a good example. The top of the D, although it's almost completely merged in with the rim, you can still see that there's a relatively sharp top to the D. Now that sharp top does have some flow lines. You can see the little flow lines running from the top of the D to the rim, even though they are extremely short, but they're still there. So you have some flow lines, but you still have sharpness. That's mid die state. Did I say something wrong? Macro comes in play. Re oh, referring to the f field vision size or the border. Okay. Yes. So that's the, the macro actually allows for an expansion of the overall size of the field that you're seeing. I'm very, very close into these coins. So we can see any little tiny fly spec details. So if you happen to see something that looks like it could possibly be doubling, but it's very, very minor, uh, it's probably because we're looking at this at like 10,000 times. It's almost electron microscope size here. If I back off to the size that I would normally look at stuff, it's about like this. <clears throat> can't see it at this magnification it's not really worth seeing yeah your phone lenses are very small that is correct 
Phone lenses are tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. All right, Bob. I'm going to get my hand out of the way. <laughs> there we go. Let me see if I can make this larger now. They gave me a problem earlier. Nope. See, now it works. Lots of little variables that go into just exactly how all of this stuff works. Lots of little variables and how the settings work. Hello, Ken. Um, this camera is actually a camera that came with the scope. I have a trinocular scope, which means that you have the two lenses that you look through with your eyes. That's the binocular part. And trinocular means three lenses. So there's actually a tube sticking straight up out of the top of the microscope. And the camera that I have for this microscope actually fits in that trinocular hole for the microscope. And it photographs on its own lens going straight through the top of the microscope. The camera itself is an MU-1803. It is a scope, a scope camera that's sold by Amscope. It is an 18 megapixel camera. And as you can see, it has video capability. So this is a mid-die state reverse here. We've been mostly seeing late die state reverses. This one's a mid-die state. Relatively sharp, relatively crisp, relatively nice outer edges to the lettering, but there are some flow lines. And those flow lines are most easily seen right here as a halo. It's a light colored halo around the top of the letters toward the rim. <clears throat> I wish I understood a little bit more about the whole magnification thing and the numbers they use, but I'm rather limited in my scope of knowledge with regard to lenses and exactly what the numbers all mean. I guess over the years I've gotten kind of lucky getting equipment that works for me because I get what I think will work and when I get it and it doesn't I figure out why get something that does <clears throat> my first camera for use through a microscope was a Sony Mavica I don't remember what the model number was, but it was a 1.3 megapixel camera and it used floppy diskettes. It used the three and a half inch floppy diskettes to save pictures on. At its highest quality at 1.3 megapixels, you could save about five pictures per, per diskette and then you had to change to a different diskette. But you could use as many diskettes as you wanted to and I had boxes of them. That was purchased in 1998. Cost a little better than $900 in 1998. If you can find those cameras, and you can actually find a battery that still works for them, you'd be looking at a probably a $50 item. There are so many much better cameras than those out there now. The second camera I got for use with my microscope was a little handheld snap and, a snap and shoot and move on camera. It was a Coolpix, Nikon Coolpix. Short body camera, it was a 5200. 5200 was a 5 megapixel camera. The latest camera that I used for that same purpose was a Coolpix... I don't even know what it was, but it was a nine, I think a nine, nine megapixel. Cool pics. Pretty nice camera. Works just fine. What you have to do 
to get a Coolpix to work with your microscope is focus your picture through your eyepiece and then hold the camera up to the eyepiece like it's your eye and snap your picture that way. It takes a pretty steady hand. A little difficult to do without any sort of adapter. So I actually made a PVC adapter out of a piece of PVC pipe from the hardware store. That way the lens of my camera would fit inside. Hey, stone cutter. The way the lens of my camera would fit inside that little piece of PVC and it would be held nice and firm while it was taking its photo. But I graduated last year to this scoping camera. It's actually a fully functional trinocular microscope with the intended hole for a camera. And it is so much better. The only thing, the only drawback to using this is the trinocular part uses the left lens of the microscope to do its job. What that means is that when you have the camera in use like it does, like it is right now, if you look through both eyepieces at your coin, your left eye is going to be blacked out. And all you can see is with your right eye because the left eye is being used for the camera. That's something I've never seen a workaround for that. Not yet. I've seen a number of microscopes that are trinocular. And I've yet to see one that is fully functional with both eyes and the camera in use. Good morning, Mr. Leapline. Oh, okay. Uh, so they do make one now. <clears throat> it is just a little bit of a bear to be in the middle of looking at something and then need to take a picture and have to take one of your eye pieces basically take the, the, the vision of one of your eyepieces away so that you can take a photograph. So we're up to coin number 44. Haven't found anything yet. My unfortunate prediction is that the remainder of the coins in this roll are going to be about the same. Probably not going to find anything on them. But it was worth the effort. It was well worth the effort. You never know. We're going to pop open a roll and it's going to have a dozen really nice double die reverses in it. It's what I was hoping for this time around. But it just didn't work out. Hey, yo, man. Coin number 46, 4DN. The way I'm going to handle this is as soon as we get done with this broadcast, I'm going to flip over and get ready for the next broadcast and get it started. So it looks like presently it's probably going to be just about right on the hour, 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 10 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Pacific. Four PM Sweden time. <clears throat> well, we had a pretty nice roll of coins. It just didn't happen to provide us any of what we were really looking for.
You probably hear my dog snoring in the chair over there. I'm going to tell you what, he sleeps almost all the time. He's an energetic dog when he's up. I can take him out back and tell him there's a S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L in the yard. And he goes on attack mode. Of course, his attack mode is to jump out the back door, run aimlessly across the yard, barking. And as soon as he sees something jump, he stops and gives it time to get away because he doesn't want to catch it. Tell him he needs to go after it, and he's like, oh, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> I don't want that thing. I just want to make it run. I just want to watch it run from me. <clears throat> coin number 50, last coin in the roll, goes to Mike Birchman. A little spotty on the obverse. This is a side that was pointed outward toward the world. All 53 years it's been in the tube, or in the roll. And the other side. So we unfortunately have us a, a normal 50 coin roll. Nothing here to see. All right, folks, it's 1053 right now. I will be back right at 11 o'clock. So I'll be here. And I hope you guys are too. I'll talk to you in just a few minutes.